Very good. Okay, there we go. So um, now we are, we're proceeding. Welcome, Rob. Um, and you are going to present tonight on um, still life with your smartphone. And I do have handouts here for those present. I will send these out um, via MailChimp to everybody. So if you're listening and you um, want some notes, do know that I've got a couple handouts that will come to you. I just didn't get to that today. So thank you so much. Um, welcome, Rob, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, well, great. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, you guys at uh, Traverse City Camera Club for inviting me to speak tonight. And I look forward to having um, a lot of discussion and questions as I sit in the handout. I'm not really big on doing presentations and, and talking a lot. I'm, I'm um, more of a discussion person and I'm very happy to have conversations and answer questions. But I do have four pages and 20 slides. So um, we can go through the slides rather quickly and then we'll go on to, I've got uh, around 80 or 100 images that we that are sort of grouped as to what we're gonna go over in the outline. Uh, and um, like um, uh, Dave was saying, if you have any questions, so either put them in the chat or uh, take the mic if you're down in a oh, nice group I see in Traverse City. Uh, grab the mic and you know give me a question. Uh, I'm willing to stop at any point during the during the uh, presentation. So uh, what we're going to cover tonight? Uh, let me let me bring up the the PowerPoint here. So here, I mean, I'll play it. See, it's better. Everybody, see that screen? Oh, you got to share a screen, Carol. Yep. You got to share my. Yep, I'm gonna add you. I'm gonna make you a co-host all set you should have that permission okay so um let me get back here where i can get where i can share a screen share a screen okay Okay, so let's see here. So people should be able to see that, right? We sure can. Okay, so um, I gave you that part of the beginning. I can't re read all of this, but let's see here if I can just make this go away. There we are. Okay. Um, so what we're gonna cover is these points down at the bottom, how I got started and why I like this kind of photography. What is still life photography without going into great detail? And the more importantly, why do we do it? Uh, and what can you benefit from it? And then uh, my process, how I actually do it. And then some setup and, you know, setup referring to sets and lights and that sort of thing and technical considerations. And then a brief thing about post processing and then what I think is important about final presentation, framing your, your prints. Okay, so how do I get this to go forward? How I got started? Uh, okay, there we go. <clears throat> so how did I get started? Um, you know, beginning to feel the power of uh, phone photography through personal use and some workshops. I took an early workshop with Dan Burkholder about four or five years ago now. Um, and then what that really let me do is, you know, have this way of being, you know, a contemplative dialogue with the subject matter and also allowing you to, um, you know, be very intuitive and immediate. So if I, when I shoot and I'm in the field without a tripod, I've always got it hanging around my neck. So I'm just kind of hands-free. I can be using my full size camera and then just pick up this camera and and take a picture. So some of it's that way. And then some of it's, you know, very intentional on a tripod, spending a lot of time, you know, composing and framing and that sort of thing. So you've got those two extremes, but, it, you know, you know the power of the phone if you've been using it at all yourself. Uh, I think the thing that do is to get the transition from a casual snapshots to the point where you're really looking at it as a real camera and then that'll you know improve what you're getting out of it. Um, and then the other part of it is um, 
you know, I enjoy collecting the objects that I want to take pictures of for both for current and future projects. And maybe you have things that you collect or you're interested in objects lying around the house or that are part of other hobbies, like if you're a musician or, you know, the various kinds of recreation you participate in and antiques and glassware and fabrics, et cetera. So the whole world around us, us is full of things and still life is really about looking closely at things, you know. So uh, by getting a sense of what those things are and attract your attraction to them, uh, and then figuring out ways to conceptualize that awareness, uh, you know, will allow you to become better at the composition. Um, so what is still live photography? A lot of people talk about it. One of the guys I follow is Carl Taylor, and he has these um, uh, four points, which we'll see in the next slide, I think. But essentially, uh, any image that's an inanimate adjective inanimate subject, natural or man-made. Uh, and then typical still life subjects can include flowers, banquet tables or meals, centerpieces, tools, symbolic objects. Uh, I've got to get this out of here because I can't really find a way I can, uh, excuse me while I try to figure out how to get rid of this sidebar here. Uh, For some reason, there we are. Okay, that's better. Um, I thumbnail video. Yeah, that's that's what I want to do. Okay, so now I can see all this. Um, so still life, also known in the French as nature more um, uh, painting and pieces that feature an arrangement of inanimate subjects and objects. Um, oh, this is now I'm, I'm sort of skipping ahead, but because of that mess up with the, uh, the other slide. Here we go. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So what is still life? We're back to here. So um, what you find inspiration, inspirational and ideas from studying other masters like uh, um, Chardin and Caif and Paul Cezanne and the Dutch masters. If you Google still life examples, uh, you'll see an incredible amount of images and people that you can sort of follow. The idea being that if you're not terribly familiar with still life as, as a genre, this is a really good way to get sort of uh, familiar with what it is. Um, this is uh, My Modern Met's a good website uh, for art in general, and this is their definition and what, they, what they're talking about in terms of still life and its history. Um, and then... You know, ultimately, it's really all about good composition and lighting, as all of photography really is. Uh, so there's been a lot said about photography uh, composition. Uh, and then two of the most well-known Western quotes are here. To compose a subject well means no more than to see it and present it in the strongest manner possible. And then another quote of his, which is essentially the same thing. Uh, in abbreviated form is good composition is merely the strongest way of seeing. And that second one is the one that I try to remember because uh, when you're looking at stuff that's really, you know, how well you see it and how well you can present it based on what you're seeing, that whole idea of turning the ordinary into the extraordinary comes from this sort of seeing, you know, Weston's most famous or one of his most famous series is about the green pepper. And, um, that's really all about, you know, spending a lot of time, four or five days, looking at a pepper or, and figuring out how to get a really good picture of it. Um, so why do we do still life? Uh, well, the Dutch masters used to show off their used it to show off their skills to client, and uh, it continues today as a way of for painters and photographers to practice and grow their skills of composing and shaping scenes, intentionally with light, shadow, tonality, and texture. Um, then here are some of the advantages of doing still life. Uh, you can do it in any weather. Uh, it's simple and low cost to get started. You just need your phone or a camera, a, a tabletop with the backdrop, a tripod, good window light, ideally from the north side, um, and a piece of white mat board or foam core to use as a way to bounce light back into your subject. Uh, it's natural, more intuitive, less intimidating process than setting up a professional studio. So you can have lower expectations and you're not under any kind of 
time constraints. It can be impromptu once you've had a spot set up, like let's say in the corner of a living room or a den or something where there's good light. It's easy just to get stuff and put it in there and you're set and, uh, and then start taking pictures. Uh, and then the other thing is that there's no time dependent restrictions other than the natural light. If you're using natural light for your main source, uh, you can take your time, come back to it the next day or the next day, try doing a study over time when you've got maybe some flowers where you're starting with an emerging bloom and you're photographing it till it's decayed or the, the, uh, the blossom falls off the stem. And then the other thing is that it's available to all ages and physical ability or mobility. So as we get older and we're not, you know, really up for long, long heights or getting on our knees, um, this is a good, you know, alternative um, kind of photography. Most of what I do, I'm sitting in a chair on a piano bench um, so that I'm, you know, at eye level with the subject, the table and the subject are at eye level. Um, and then we don't have to really go into this, but if I, at some point I would talk briefly about composition. Uh, think of the subject flowers in this case, maybe as a portrait or a dialogue with the flowers, looking closely and intimately at the subject, um, what, you do, what do you want to capture or convey? Um, uh, and still life is really the, that cliche of uh, finding the extraordinary and the ordinary. Again, this thing is blocking where I can see. Anyhow, onto the next slide. So my process, how do I do it? Um, there's a handout at the end of this this thing, this slide presentation, but it's not doesn't have th this uh, step by step. But this this is also included in the handout that Carol mentioned before we started. Um, and Carl Taylor is one of these people, as I said, I follow. He's a very good English uh, professional photographer who does a great uh, educational series. So he he basically breaks down the process into four steps: develop a creative concept of what you want to express or showcase. Then two, plan the image, maybe make a sketch, plans with color and contrast, use a color wheel for reference so you get your colors right. Um, and then lead the viewer's eye into the, uh, the picture, establish a point of view, uh, straight on or all the way vertical down from the top. So with a still life, it's really important to figure out where are you gonna place the camera? Like, like you know, all, all compositions, but mostly it's about what's the elevation and the angle going to the subject. A lot of what you'll see of mine is sort of head on portrait. My, what I mean with that is that the focal plane of the camera is in the same plane as the subject, maybe slightly elevated or slightly turned to the side. But you can also do it, you know, you know by moving the camera further up and the angle of where it's looking at the subject and then the other one would be you know looking straight down so there's a lot of food photography and some art photography where, where the subject is literally on the floor and you're and you're taking a picture from directly above so um, all of those things go into deciding where to put the camera so it's important that you experiment with, with experiment with that and then also that you um, you know take several pictures during each shot so that you get different angles to choose from So my process and workflow starts with choosing a backdrop that's appropriate. Black velvet is easiest, especially when the, the backdrop is close to the subject or the subject due to limited space. So a lot of the places where I shoot, I don't have a lot of room between what I'm using as a backdrop and where I'm sitting. So the idea of having the backdrop very close to the subject can produce some problems with lighting if that's a light or a neutral color. Um, so if it's really black, then you can make that go black and post-processing pretty easily. So um, that's why I sort of started with that. And predominantly, you'll see in the images to follow that I do use generally a black background. Um, choose a point of view, which is I talked about in the earlier slide, which is deciding, you know, where are you, are you gonna be looking at the subject? Is it straight on or is it an angle? off to the side. Uh, once you decided that um, by doing it with casual handheld shots with your cell phone, then put the cell phone on a tripod and then you can begin to, to take pictures from there. Most of what I do is that the, the cell phone's on a tripod with a remote release, whether that's the OEM um, headphone set or whether that's a Bluetooth trigger. 
uh, that allows you to not have to touch the camera when it's exposing and, you know, hence maybe, you know, um, jiggle the shot or, or make it uh, not sharp. Because what will happen is, is sometimes you'll get longer exposures because you're not really using, you know, you know, super amount of light. And so the, uh, the camera may doing, be doing a 30th of a second or longer. And if you touch the camera, touch the phone, then it could, uh, uh, you know, make the, thought, the shot on sharp. So the other thing, and maybe in one of the other parts of this slide, is to remember that with your phones, at least with the iPhones, I'm sure it's true with the Androids, if you tap the screen, you'll get a little box that'll show where the focus and exposure is. And then you can move that around to someplace that you want it to select focus for and exposure for. Touch that, and then you'll, you'll lock the focus, and then there will be a slider on the right-hand side, and you can slightly adjust the, the exposure uh, you know, before you take the shot. Not so critical because you're going to be doing some kind of a post process on it anyhow, but just so that you know. Um, so that's what I'm saying here. Touch the screen. It's right here. Yeah, touch the screen to bring the focus and exposure box to acquire accurate focus and exposure. And then with a remote shutter release in one hand and a small reflector in the other hand, um, use that to add highlights by bouncing light into the subject that's needed. So uh, I can show you the once we get off of the screen, but usually what I've got in my hand when I'm taking these things is some small reflector, either a handmade one with a tin foil on it or a store-bought, um, you know, something that's 18 inches or 12 inches in diameter that I can, you know, manipulate in real time and see how much um, light I'm putting into the subject. Um, so technical considerations and setup. Uh, so really, we can go through this really quickly. Smartphone um, and a, a portrait or telephoto lens. This is kind of important because you want to fill the frame. So rather than using the native wide angle lens on cameras, prior to cameras having three plus lenses on them, we used I used auxiliary or still do use an auxiliary lens. I used the moment lens. And that brings the uh, the aspect ratio down to what it's about a 35 to 50 millimeter um, lens in a um, in what we would call 35 millimeter format. A lot of us, you know, from the 35 millimeter um, background, think of lenses in terms of what's the aspect ratio or what's going to be the characteristic of the lens based on what it's going to be like on a 35 millimeter or full frame camera. So anything from like you know. 40 to 100 is about where you want it to be, uh, essentially what would be like a portrait lens. Most of what I do looks kind of like, aside from the fact that it's not lit as a portrait, but it's that sort of aspect in terms of how close you are to the subject. Um, so in DLSL, DSLRs, you want to be in live mode, and then with mirrorless, you're going to be looking at the back screen. Uh, then that could either be tethered or, mon or to a monitor to allow you to see in real time view the lighting and the key and make key changes. Um, so, you know, in, in a cell phone, you're always looking at the live view, but with the other cameras, it's important to do that because you wanna be able to modify the light as you're looking at the subject and you're, and you're taking the picture at the same time. So um, then light modifiers are important. So light modifiers include bounce uh, fill from the side top and and from below, much like an eye lighter reflector used for fashion portraits and headshots. So if you look at a, the way they do a, a fashion shot, there's often a reflector that's right at the at the base, maybe at the at the arms of the waist of a subject that's reflecting light back up into the subject. So what I do is I often place a reflector either on the table I'm using or on the tripod. So it's reflecting light about a 45 degree angle back in to the lower side of the subject and giving it, you know, sort of some lift and eliminating some shadows. Um, and then continuing on with set, with setup, um, there's a I'm putting some stuff in here about tables and surfaces. So the table can be can be pretty much anything that's large enough to support your setup. Uh, and then you want it to be, you know, table to to countertop height, uh, depending on what's comfortable for you. And if you're sitting on a bar stool or sitting at a table, uh, it should be sturdy enough 
to avoid undue vibration and movement during longer exposures. But anything will work. Two chairs with a plank across them is what I've seen in some videos. A uh, collapsible pair of sawhorses uh, with a board or a piece of plywood across it. A uh, card or a folding table. Your dining room table. Your kitchen countertop. Um, any place where you can have good light. So it's really, you know, it doesn't take a lot, but you just have to sort of think about these considerations. The other thing that you can do if you get into it is you can make a specific tabletop or a cube-like cage uh, to support assorted coverings and lighting. And then I could explain my experience later, but essentially you make a, a tube frame out of PVC or something else that's uh, that allows you to then, you know, hang lights or fabrics or bounce cards or whatever off of that, rather than having a bunch of tripods or not having any tripods. And then, um, uh, with backdrops, I'm throwing out the idea to, to get you to think about what you might have to hold the backdrop up. So, like if you have an old slide viewing screen, you could use that as the back screen and drop a piece of fabric over that. What I used in one of the shots you'll see later is an old window screen supported on a little one by four frame. Think about an old flat screen TV or the one that's in your living room or make a PVC frame like uh, I can talk about later. Um, and, and then I'll show a slide of the PVC tools and supplies. And then uh, what I'm suggesting, if you get into that, that you would use three quarter inch PVC for larger frames and then half inch PVC pipe. This is PVC plumbing or irrigation pipe. Uh, half inch would be fine for smaller frames. Um, the other tip about backdrop is to keep the backdrop fabric relatively clean, especially if it's velvet, which is a, an ideal material to use. So keep around a vacuum or rolled up tape, uh, you know, masking tape or something for a lint or a lint tool. Fabric steamers are helpful. The idea, and then clean, make sure all of your glassware is as clean as you can get it. The idea here is that a clean set helps reduce post-processing cleanup and gives you time while you're doing all of this. Well, I better clean that, better clean this. Uh, to consider the details that you're that you're trying to bring out in the the image that you've planned and reflect on the arranging process because arranging is, you know, you know, a large part of what you're trying to uh, control with your process. And then um, if you get into this, you'll, there'll be lots of diffusion that you'll want to do and, and light modifiers, things that are like, you know, like a piece of white foam core or a mat board. Uh, and then for reflecting light and then for diffusing light, let's say you've got a really bright day and you want to make it, you know, sort of a, a, a more muted light, you could put something over the window, like an old sheet or an old shower curtain. One of the tricks that I learned from videos online is you make a frame using baker's parchment, which is that paper people use for baking to keep things from sticking. You can stretch the baker's par parchment over a frame of foam core, for instance, and then that becomes a diffuser. You can put that in front of your light source to get uh, a more diffuse light. Um, and then there's lots of commercial uh, collapsible reflectors. One of them is a five in one, which has a black, a white, um, a translucent for, for diffusing, and then a, a couple of warming, uh, warming reflectors, like a gold reflector. Okay, so that's that. And then for post processing, I mostly use Snapseed. I also use Retouch, which is mostly for line removal. It's really great at that in small objects. And then view effects, which I mostly use for um, when I'm looking at iPhone pictures to review the metadata. So that's a whole different discussion. But the idea being knowing whether you've, you've still got it either in raw, or whether you have it in the uh, H, uh, EIC format or whether you've converted it to JPEG. So that will make a difference in terms of you know what you're showing to, uh, to uh, for show or what you're going to take back and do more editing to. And then ideally, I mean, you can add it, you can edit on a phone and, you know, now with the larger screens, it's, it's much easier, but ideally, if you're going to do any serious editing and you want to do it on an iPad or a tablet uh, and then use the stylus, because then you can get in and, and make a, a small brush and, and do some fine uh, adjusting of the image. Um, and then here I'm going to cite uh, Rad Drew, who's a great iPhone photographer and Dan Ber Burkholder, who's sort of the father of doing uh, really good work with iPhones. And both of those uh, have great workflows. 
And in the handout, uh, there's a there's a link to both of their websites and some of their videos. Um, and then in the reference sides, I will be showing um, uh, some places to follow on YouTube and social media. That's it. But that so there's there are two um, two uh, tech body texts in one of the handouts. It's got people to go to for class and people to go to for online uh, video stuff. The other thing about about online um, looking at various things for um, still life photography and flower photography is there's just a wealth of stuff on YouTube and also on Facebook. I follow a number of Facebook groups that do still life. And so it's, it's inspirational to see what these people are doing. Uh, so then the final presentation, use a good quality print. I prefer matte or pearl finish as a, for the saturation and the non-glare viewing. Um, I, there's a few frames that I'll be in my uh, picture show that show the, the way I frame it. Uh, but I essentially use a traditional gallery style, simple black frame with a neutral or warm white thick mat, like a six or eight ply mat with wide generous margins. Um, also, you might consider size. So with a small sensor, 12 megapixel, um, we might want to uh, have smaller prints that are best. Um, I like the idea of holding a framed print at arm's length, about the same distance as an original shot, as originally shot. So think in terms of life spot, <laughs> start, think in terms of life size images or slightly smaller so that you can put it in a frame that somebody can hold that at arm's length. Um, it's important to you. I, I think it's important to use non glare UV resistant acrylic glazing. It's lightweight, more economical than museum glass. And then uh, the only downside is that it uh, takes a little bit more uh, cleaning. You should use a special cleaner, no Windex or any kind of you know uh, solvent cleaners. Um, I've had very good results using American Frame and their Assemble at Home system, where you just buy the frame, the mat, and the glazing, and you'll put it all together once you get it back to the house. Um, another alternative for avoiding the, the issue of, of window glass is to use a canvas uh, or a metal print, uh, which wouldn't require any glazing. And that would be alternative to putting it in a, a traditional frame. Um, and I, I would suggest people, you know, consider some form of do-it-yourself framing if you're not already. Uh, online ready to assemble systems um, are, are great for using frames by using a tinge, uh, a T-hinge mounting a method for your prints. Um, so then, this this is uh, I'll go through these slides, which there's not many, and then uh, we'll go back to we'll go to the to the album of pictures. So this is one of my setups in the front room of our house. Uh, it's a north light window. It's just on an end table. Uh, it's about a two by th four, maybe two and a half by four uh, old aluminum screen that's sort of hung on a piece of one by four with some utility clamps. And then I cover that with a piece of felt with a um, piece of velvet. <coughs> Excuse me. Using cl clothes lines or clamps to secure the, the uh, backdrop to the frame. This is a picture of a uh, picture of a picture of the camera and a subject on that setup. So you can see how you know I'm only using you know a small portion of the setup to um, to get the picture. What's reflected in the face of the camera is what's behind me on the piano top, and I'm sitting on a piano bench. Um, this is uh, the uh, the camera adapter I use the tripod and one of the Bluetooths I use. It's uh, Me Photo, uh, which is, there's several of them. I like this one because of the various um, options that it has. It's got a quarter inch and three eight threaded holes in the bottom and then quarter inch holes in the top. So it's a lot of different versatility with um, how you can mount the um, the camera in the in the in the rig. And then the cam kicks uh, Bluetooth. There's several of those uh, you get in a pack. I get like get them three in a pack. And so there's always one lying around. It's got a wrist strap so you don't lose it when you're out in the field. <clears throat> so this is this shows a little bit more of what else is going on. There's 
a piece of foam core on the right hand side, which is reflecting window light back into the subject. And then I've got an LED light up at the top, uh, right coming down on an angle to put a highlight in the, um, in the subject. Um, you can do it. I'm doing this with my mirrorless, but you can obviously do it with a smartphone. You know, uh, in fact, the picture, that's a smart, no, that's not, this is a smartphone picture. And this is what you see from this to this. Um, and that's uh, just getting close with the, uh, with the uh, iPhone. Okay, so this is the online resources I talked about, uh, YouTube channels for people to follow. Um, uh, John Gian Don Gianetti is really good on doing um, various photos. He's also got a creative light class. Phil McCurdle is a semi-retired English uh, studio photographer and food photographer. Uh, he does really good um, videos. The Slanted Lens is also the same thing. They've got a great series on the loss of light and uh, all aspects of photographic basics and advanced. Um, and particularly for people who are looking to make money, he's got a whole course on uh, good ways to start making money in photography. Uh, and then this is the instruction uh, sheet on this. So Dan Burkholder is great. Uh, Rad Drew's also good. Charles Needle will be coming to see you. You could ask him about his classes um, on iPhone photography. And then Ahmed Mersman is somebody I just met this, this last winter he teaches in Midland, um, and he spoke at Crooked Tree. That um, that that lecture it was a coffee at ten is recorded and on the I think it's up by now on the Crooked Tree website. And then of course Tony Northrup. Um, the reason I mentioned Mersman is because he's not only a an artist, a really good graphic artist as well, but he has done a lot of hybrid work where he's doing some of his his drawings and then including them in photography. And he, he does a lot of work with iPhone. And then uh, thanks for listening and happy holidays. If you have any further questions, please feel free to contact me. Here's my information. And then some miscellaneous all non information. Uh, this is an interesting piece on Edward Weston's uh, pepper series um, that was in the wiki uh, entry. And then the, below that is what was on the... Uh, Traverse City um, Camera Club's Facebook page uh, by one of your members recently. And this is a pretty easy, simple, quick how to still do still life. Sorry about the TCA. I, I thought it was Traverse City area. So um, I, I, you know, I, I apologize for that typo. But so that's the um, that's the show. And uh, let me get out of here. And I'm going to open uh, while you're thinking about questions. I will open up the um, the the album I want to show. Um, <clears throat> so, is there any questions at this point? Yep, we've got one. Yeah, we have up. one. We have one coming up. Okay. Oh, uh, Rob, do, Rob, do you want to turn your camera on? Oh, my camera's not on? Well, because um, part of it is because I guess, no, maybe, maybe it's not on. Let's see here. Oh, there we go. Oh, okay. Perfect. Thank you. Hi, Don Daniels. Uh, do you ever have problems with depth of field? And if you do, how do you handle it? I don't really worry about it. Um, the thing the the thing about the 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 phone cameras is they they do a pretty good job you know of, of handling that because the lenses are wide right so even even with you know the the telephoto the 58 millimeter moment lens on it you know you're still you know if you're if you're at it's if, if it starts at a native 26 you're at a 50 something so and most of the stuff I'm doing, you know, you'll see a fall off. In fact, I'll even use um, when I'm using Snapseed, I'll sometimes do a lens blur. But most of the stuff is in plane and um, it's not something that I, you know, really worry about. I do when I do the when I do the um, the full frame stuff, 
uh, in mirrorless or or in um, you know D DSLR, you know I'll, I'll pay attention to that and I'll do a high a high f stop or I'll do uh, focus stacking. But most of the, virtually everything you're going to see here, you saw in those images, uh, is that this is, is all iPhone. I have, so, I have a question. I have a yeah. question, Rob. This is uh, Ragnar. Oh, hi. Um, hey, so you talked about Snapseed. Do you choose that over Lightroom and Photoshop for what reason? Is it just from ease or what? Yes, it's it's because it's easy. And, and I got sort of doing it before Lightroom was available for the phone. So um, all of the stuff I do, I mean, the, the, the problem is then it becomes, you know, you have to then import all that stuff into, um, into Lightroom if you're going to do anything more with it so, or Photoshop. So if I'm going to take an image and then make it into something where I want to make exact size or I want to clean it up better, then I'll, you know, I'll import it into Lightroom and then, you know, clean it up in Photoshop or size it in Photoshop. One of the things I've done with, uh, the smaller um, 8 by 12s is I'm leaving like a 3 8 or a 5 16 white paper border all around the image. And to do that, I need to give the printer, you know, an exact image size. So, you know, I'll put that into Photoshop and, and give them precise measurements to, to print. But in general, it's just because it's so much easier. I mean, you can literally sit in your easy chair with a stylus or your finger you know, and do, you know, amazing work um, in Snapseed. So that's, that's the reason. Okay. Thank uh, and you. then some people, people don't, uh, some people don't have Lightroom, you know, or they've been intimidated by it. So the idea that this is an accessible way for people to do some fairly serious editing of an image that they've, that they've uh, produced on their phone. So. Thank you. Anybody, Anybody else have else? a question? Yes, yes. Um, and there's one uh, question in the chat, Rob. Are you using yeah. the raw setting on your iPhone? No, I'm using um, I'm using the H C I C H H E I C on the phone at highest quality. Okay. It's what what I I got started doing that before they had raw for the phone, so it um, it seems to I don't even know that I don't know that Snap that even works on raw. It may, you know. But yeah. there's enough there's enough latitude in uh, the high efficiency um, file to do a, a lot of work uh, without a lot of noise. So that's that's kind of what it what I do. Very good, thank you. Any other questions here? Okay, why don't you okay. go ahead? Okay, so people see that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is one of the ones that um, sort of get, got me started thinking about, you know, the potential of what you can do. This is that window sitting on, on that, you know, on that end table in front of a uh, window screen with black velvet. Uh, you can see the reflection of the, uh, the window and you can actually see me in it too. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but right about here is where I am. And then this little highlight here is one of the reflectors that I'm holding. Mm -hmm. So the issue with, with this kind of stuff is that if you were going to do this as a professional product shot, you know, people would say this is terrible because you've got all of these, you know, highlights and spectral things that are in, in this uh, image and you're losing all of this glazing down here. So you're making the decision to say, well, do I want to make this a professional product shot or do I want to make this arty? And part of it is for me, I know where I was when I took this picture because there's the living room window. So you need to sort of think about what's art and what's commercial when you do these. Mm -hmm. um, and then this one is an example of where it was when it came, when I took it into Snapseed. I mean, there's probably an, uh, no. so yeah, so it's, it, it's, you know, you're seeing all the velvet. This is dull up here. Um, this is crooked. The velvet is dirty. That's why I was mentioning earlier that it's good if you're using something like velvet or any kind of a dark filter, something you want to, be fairly careful about how clean you keep it because uh, you got, you know, this, this one is not bad because there's not a lot of spots to pick up, but, and then it's important to know what kind of background you use. For instance, same image, different background has, you know, this has not been 
<laughs> worked on in post, but still, you know, you can see that there's too much there's too much uh, similarity between the the value for the flowers and the value for the backdrop. I had thought that I'd like a white linen kind of like grayish color, but when I looked at it, you know, it, it just didn't work. So so that's the image. This is kind of getting to that, and then that's what it looks like framed. And part of the reason this this has that brilliance is because uh, you're offsetting the picture the dark picture with a very generous frame. This is a six ply mat from American frame. And then the glazing here is non glare. So there's nothing really literally nothing between you and the image. And then if you're holding it at arm's length, you're really spending time with it. You're not just walking, walking by the image. Um, this is another one of those, this, this one I've decided to ground it on a, on a doily. Uh, so those are the things you sort of got to, uh, are you seeing? Are you guys seeing my screen? Uh, you know, I'm yeah. seeing. Okay, um, so so that's the idea. That, again, you can see these specular highlights in here, and I'm not really, you know, offended by those. I kind of like them. I want to get to the point where I can do this without them, but I haven't got there, and it's and it's quite a bit more work to do that with um, with the way you have to shield the lighting. So it would take a little bit of the spontaneity out of it and the, you know, the casualness of the of the experience to to get rid of those. And then this is a you know an alternative frame in Snapseed just to give it a little you know out, you know, antique -y look. It looks like a glass plate or a tin type, and that's it framed. Um, there's a little bit of a highlight here from well, I did this work kind of quick for a show, but. The idea was to show you what it would look like. Ideally, I would have brought a couple of these with me had I been able to come down in person. That's why I put these in the in the stack. Uh, then this is, you know, again using the uh, the black background and then um, leaving. I decided I wanted the lines in this shot, but you can in post processing you can get all of this to look as black as the background is is in here. Pretty easy too. It's literally the swipe of a finger. Um, this one sort of floats, uh, this one would, the other thing is that I haven't done it with these, but because this is on a back rack, background, people who do a lot of post-processing know that I could easily just take this thing and put it anywhere as I wanted. I could put this in a composite or something like that. But part of it is I also like the idea of floating it for the abstract feeling. Uh, and then this is, this is a setup on a countertop just hanging a black piece of uh, fabric over the uh, upper cabinets um, and then, you know, elevating the subject to where I could be uh, taken with, um, you know, closer to what I wanted to see. Part of it is you don't want to end up having the, in this case, I didn't want uh, the the countertop involved. So lifting it up and part of it's convenience too. Just so, uh, but it also gives you an idea. You can use little or anything as a pedestal. This is just, Handful of handful of books from the bookcase, uh, and this is outside. So just having some kind of a backdrop that you can stand up. This is um, neutral gray ba background material on a um, piece of foam core taped to a piece of foam core that's just stood up against uh, uh, probably a deck chair or something, uh, so we can get a picture of that flower. And then this is what that flower would look like with a little bit of snap seed. Um, that might have even been a handheld. I don't know. But, um, you know, just sort of getting the idea, well, I want to make sure I can get this picture without the back of the house or the cat or something else coming across the frame. So um, and the same thing. That, so in, along the same lines, this is a night blooming uh, Sirius that, uh, you know, you have to do at night. This is the overhead lights from the porch that's lighting the uh, the setup. But what's really going on is I'm taking a picture with this light down here and I'm, uh, I'm using the ambient of the overhead. And then this is that reflector I was talking about, which is bouncing light back up into the flower from the overhead and from this little guy down here. Uh, and then this, this is just to bounce a little bit of, of light into that side over here. Um, to give it to lighten up some of the shadows and that's what it looks like when you're uh when you um see what the camera is seeing what's going on here
This, maybe this is some of this is out of order. Could be it to here. Okay, we did that. So you can see how close I'm sitting to the to the image here. Well, I'll, I'll just go through these quick because I don't know how we got here, but this is an example of some of the setups that that uh, Don Gianni has in his in his class. He's he does a lot of teaching, and then he has students uh, show him what they've done. So this is a a setup, but this is more like with artificial light in a studio setting. But you can see they've got the black background, a big diffuse overhead, and then a reflector on the side reflect reflecting back in this is making a false window by having an old window frame and a piece of fencing down here and then a couple of lights so the idea is that you can really you know develop a scene pretty easily with a little bit of imagination and the reason i take these and put them in here is because i've used these ideas in some of my stuff i actually have one of these 24 inch octaboxes and uh sometimes i use a flash in it when i'm doing uh, regular, you know, um, DSLR or mirrorless shoots. But if I'm using the uh, iPhone, I'll instead of a flash unit back here, I'll I'll just strap a loom cube or some kind of an LED, you know, video light to the back of that. It'll put out enough light for for what I'm doing. This is somebody else is doing this, and part of what I'm showing here is that sometimes you may not want all of this window light coming down on whatever it is you're doing. So just block some of it out. So essentially only the light from above this above this black card is coming down on this subject. You know, so you can get a nice sort of slanted look rather than being blasted by this this huge thing. So if you've got a big, you know, patio door or a big picture window, you don't want all the light, put some other kind of a diffuser up and then lay some boards across it, either, you know, uh big panels. You can use like full-size insulation they use for uh, house building, you know, that comes in four by eight sheets. So think about how big that is and then how you could cover that. You could put black paper on it. You could spray paint it black. Uh, there's lots of ways that you could control that light. <laughs> Excuse me. This is one of my setups. It's actually where I am right now. So I'm sitting here by the window. This is the north window light. This is a, a shot that I'm setting up. And this is that frame I was talking about. So this is a <coughs> excuse me, plywood table with three quarter inch PVC on four corners. That's got a, a, a square of PVC on the top. This is seamless paper behind here. Uh, and I'm using this light from the window. This is this whole scene is literally lit just with that window. These are a little bit of accent lights that I use once in a while. These are by Loom Cube, by the way, which are great little accent lights. And then this, this is on a small rig arm. And because this, this is th three quarter inch PVC, you can clamp anything you want to any of these posts uh, around your set and um, you know be able to d direct the light. So that's, um, that's the setup. This is the picture before I did any Snapseed to it. And that's in Snapseed. So the difference between that and this is pretty dramatic. Uh, and that's, you know, it's probably 15 minutes, 20 minutes at the most of playing around with it in Snapseed with a stylus uh, on, virtually on my lap. So um, this is um, an example used in some barn wood. And part of the reason I've got this in here is that this is a bad choice for a background because there's not a lot not a lot of value difference between the flowers in color or in, in shade to the background. So I could fix it a little bit, and I did, and this is what you get in um in after Snapseed. So that's before Snapseed, after Snapseed. Uh th this is uh, some of the inspiration I get for still life. And this is uh, I mentioned earlier about going to the internet for inspiration. Uh, if you just Google still life photography, you'll get all of this, you know, in the in the front page. And then you can just sort of dive in there and find stuff that you like. So let's say you like doing food. So there's all this food stuff. Maybe you like doing fishing gear or gun gear or uh, fly fishing or um, whatever it is, pottery, uh, glassware. Um, all of these things are um, people are doing all of the things that you would probably be attracted to. Uh, um, this is an example of a 
sort of classic imitation of a Enceladums. This might even be the Enceladums. I can't remember now. But um, it, this to show that it's this is kind of an antique look, that people have been doing this for a very long time uh, in photography. Uh, this is another one of a of a Facebook uh, file from um, from a, a still life. I can't. I still can't see the top of this these frames because of the way the zoom folder is set up. I don't know how to hide that, but anyhow. So this one of these. I think. Oh, here is still still life by flashlight. So there's a whole group of people who do you know, starting with a dark slide, you know, in the dark and then lighting it with a flashlight to get this. So this is something I haven't really got to do yet, but um, there's actually a new program uh, that's available for the phone. It's been around for a couple of years. I think it's called Slow Shutter. And it essentially lets you build an image from a dark screen by adding light in, in real time. So Olympus had a program for their... Um, crop sensor cameras for a long time that would let you do that. And it's still available. And then this is a, a new system for doing it anyway. But anyway, the idea is that you get these wonderful sort of like warm uh, highlights in the image. But even so, if this was just done as a regular still life, a lot of it's like old cameras. So it's a, it's a great way to sort of think about, well, maybe I've got one or you can borrow one from a friend or whatever and begin to compose something like this. I like tools, so eventually I'm gonna start doing some of this stuff, I don't have all of the chisels, but I've got a lot of old planes. <clears throat> so that's a winter project for me. But the, I mean, I, I'll occasionally look at these and go, well, I like the way it's lit or I like the arrangement and uh, it's good inspiration. Just a few more of these from the internet. So maybe you play cards or you've got an old fedora that you want to do something with. These are ideas for how that could happen. Um, if you've got some old uh, tin pots or I've started collecting those oil cans. I want to do something with those. Uh, love the tones in this. <laughs> Same thing with this. And then this is going back to, you know, a, a painter. This was an online thing of a painter doing a live show of this is what was on the table. This was his palette. And this is what he was painting. But the idea being that, you know, you can sort of look at this and see the arrangement. You can see the colors and the tones and the lighting and to say it inside. Well, you know, I've got some gourds or I've got some apples. I want to do this on a rainy day or a cold, snowy day. Um, and if you if it's hard for you to conceptualize what this looks like, there's no shame in going to and borrowing somebody else's ideas for this stuff. A lot of that, you know, has happened through art and photography over the years. Anyhow, what was that thing of something about the most serious form of flattery is it's not copying, but it's imitation. Imitation is the one of the most sincere forms of flattery or something like that. Um, so a couple more of these, this is oh this. So there, there's a Facebook page just called still life. So, that, you know, you can go there and look at what they're doing there. Um, and this was, a th you know, some flowers for a birthday. So you know, put them on that table by the, by the front window and started taking pictures of that. Uh, same, you know, it's front light, side light from the window side light from a bounce card and a little bit of fill light from the front with a reflector and maybe a highlighted LED. Um, and then I, I made a black and white of that, but a little bit of tone according to this image, but you, it's more neutral in the original image. Um, again, more, more of these, uh, you know, trying different vases, different colors. Um, you know, the reason I got the blue is it goes with the yellow. The reason I know that is because I've got a color wheel. Uh, I don't know whether I've got it around here, but um, oh, oh, here it is. So it's, it'll be, there'll be a slide of it coming up. But the idea is to have a color wheel, you know. So um, it, but one time I didn't have a lot of confidence in what color tie I should wear. But if you have one of these or if you just, you know, spending as much time as photography as all of us have, uh, you get sort of attuned to that, but this is a good way to sort of dial it in and refresh your memory uh, or understanding of color theory. So this was uh, another one of those setups where it was in that front window, and I brought this in to show you a before and after of Snapseed. So that's the final image after Snapseed, and that's the image before Snapseed. So it's dull. It's, you know, a little bit. And, and about the 
the depth of field, there's a lot of parts of this that are not in in focus at all. It's mostly down in here. But with, um, if you look at this, uh, if I can, you can see that all of the stuff that's down here is really in great focus or good enough focus. Um, and, and it's because, you know, I, I set the camera uh, by touching the screen and said, focus here or focus, it might've been here or here on the rows. And then, you know, like Snapseed has a, um, a structure and a, uh, a couple of places where you can do sharpness um, on it. And it's not as good as some of the other programs, but it's good enough in a lot of respects. So for instance, if, if you want to bring up structure by 10 or 15%, and maybe bring up uh, sharpening by 10, 10 or 15% at the most, uh, you'll get some really good results. And so it's worth, it's worth using that part of the, that program. Um, and you can see how different this one looks because there's no, no detail virtual, virtually at all on that piece of driftwood. And then that's the, the flower from that same picture. So there, there's that picture, here's the flower. And then there's the flower there. That's all in Snapseed. So you know I've been you know very very happy with uh, what I can get with that. And that's that's that picture before it was processed in Snapseed. So it's it's fairly dull and not a lot of contrast in it. But I could make it you know make it like that with with the Snapseed. Uh, then I was talking earlier about doing stuff in succession. So you've got maybe. Starting with a bloom and going through this one, I just started with the lilies as they were about to lose their leaves. I only did a couple of these. Uh, and then that's it with the leaves drying. And then um, that's it in black and white with a little, you know, sort of vintage frame around it. Um, more of that, more, just more of these things. This one, this series of four is to show, excuse me. <laughs> The idea of like you know depending on how you look at you know where where you put the camera where the, where the frame points are uh, of the image so makes a different image like so this is sort of you know head on portrait eye level not very interesting it wasn't a great image to start with but there's some better ones at the end so i started there then this is it before um before I went into Snapseed, so you can see I changed things a little, you know, made it richer and got rid of the shadows in the background. And then, you know, went, went above, right? So you've got that shot, that's that's interesting. And then I did that. So the, all of those shots are from the same setup. So it was a question of, you know, what what's gonna what's gonna be interesting here? And, uh, you know, the last one to me is the one that I, that I liked the best. Um, so just more of these, I think, I don't know where we are in the slideshow, but bear with me. We doing all right on time? Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, okay. no, we're good. All right. Um, I have a quick question, Rob. Sure. Yeah. So you, your ability to basically have the table and the background go to complete black, you were saying mm -hmm. it was a slider and Snapseed. Can you give us a little bit more information about how you got that to go like perfect black, no well, it's you know it's 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 just sliding the shot, maximizing the shadows, right? So, uh, and if you can't get it, then you then you've got too much light on. Part of it is you want to make sure that you're almost like for, this is a good example. So most of that is black already, right? And it's only down here where these highlights are. So, for instance, I would take the shadows down as far as I could without you know, messing up the shadows in the subject. And I might just do it with a brush. So in Snapseed, there's a brush tool. And in there you can do, there's four different things you can do. One is saturation, one is EV, and one is burn and dodge. If you do the EV one, which is exposure value, I think it's three stops maybe or something like that. I put that at, you know, at maybe minus three, uh, 0.3 or, so, or minus seven. I think maybe it's just one stop. Because yeah, it's like it's like zero, three, seven, and then one. I think so. Maybe it's only one full stop. So, so anyhow, the point being is that you can then take a brush and get all of the stuff here to go black. Um, and I haven't had trouble with doing that. 
So that's there's there's enough latitude in the shadow tool and in the uh, other one. So you know, at some point we could do a whole thing on Snapseed, but the the simple answer to Sap, Snapseed is you go into the first uh, the first section, which is has like about six or seven different parameters. I think it's a just image or whatever. And if you crank down the highlights all the way, see what that does without dulling things. Maybe go back up and bring exposure down a little bit, and then play with uh, ambience, which is uh, a boost for midtones, and then maybe bring down uh, the shadows a little bit without dulling out stuff like this. Like if I, you know, if I brought the shadows all the way down, I would lose some of this detail in here, which I don't want to do. So that's kind of the quick answer to Snapseed. Um, so we were we were there. So this is that. This one was in the show down a couple of years ago, um, and this one is not perfect. You can I, this may be the one I didn't send in for print. There's a couple of spots in here where it's not matte black. Um, And then stuff like this, it's just, you know, you you could never do that, you know, in the in the field with milkweed. So to be able to, I mean, I, I didn't literally drag this one down, but I blew on it enough so that something happened. And that was the happy accident that that guy hung on like it did. But again, it's like, you know, there's a, it's a fairly flat field. And you can see, you know, in the back here, some of that's soft, you know, but the stuff up front here, this is all pretty good, you know. All this detail in here, all the stuff in here. So um it, it holds up pretty well, surprisingly well with depth of field. I think it's because it's such a small sensor. Uh and this is the idea of like, you know, if you've got stuff around the house, get it before it blooms, right? And so this one is before it blooms. I didn't get to an emerging spot, but that's what it looked like when it bloomed. So it's nice to have those, you know, that progress uh, of of the images. Um, this is a series I started uh, using old pulleys. So um, it's on the table behind me. Um, just a piece of uh, burlap. Burlap makes a great tabletop. It's a good, you know, texture, uh, mid-tone kind of like um, material for a surface. So that's, that's it in the black and white. That's it. Um, you know, with um, with some snapseed work and vignetting and a little bit of soft focus, they've got a great blur tool in there. Um, that's another one with you know with more vignetting and blur. Uh, this has got quite a bit of blur in it, um, more of a top down look, and this is sort of the same kind of deal. Uh, and then this is uh, some of my abstracts I did. Um, I took a class with Leon. Nash up at the college here, the community college, Northern Michigan. And he does a, an intro to blacksmithing class. He's got a lot of great, really old uh, tools. Some of them are handmade. Some of them are hand forged. Um, and it just, you know, makes some for some great um, abstract images in, in, in metal and, you know, the beauty of the design and the, the workmanship. So that's part of a bench uh, of blacksmith's vice. That's uh, black and white treatment in uh, Snapseed. Uh, that's the original image before I did that, before I did that. Uh, and then this is a, a part, another part of that same bench vice. This is hand forged because all of these bevels are not even. So that was all hit, bevels were all made with a uh, blacksmith's hammer. That's a way you can tell whether these tools were handmade or whether they were machine made is by some of the, uh, the handwork on them. And then that's it with um, my rendering in Snapseed. So to go from that to this, you know, in maybe 20 minutes, you know, that's fairly dramatic. You know, I'm pretty happy with this one. Uh, same thing, this, this is, he has a whole sort of closet full of all of these tools accumulated from estate sales and auctions and stuff like that. This is a whole I don't even know what these crank things are. Uh, the other ones are clearly vices, but what the crank things are, I don't know. So, you know, look at a box of those things and say, what's the strong part of that that I want? And that's what I got was this. Uh, again, Snapseed and um, handheld with an iPhone. 
So, um, it's, you know, just an example of, you know, if you're, if you're looking for something, um, you know, what you can find. Okay. So some of the, the nuts and bolts of this, this is the moment lens, uh, for iPhone, for anybody's phone, for uh, for Android too. Now they've got the three cameras on on the newer phones. It's not so much three lenses on the newer phones. It's not so much an issue. Um, but these are really nice glass. It's uh, it's you know, it's all glass. It's all aluminum, our aircraft quality frame. So it's really nicely made stuff, and it gives you really great rendering. So. You know, if you can take your 2X telly on the new phones and make it a 4X, essentially, with this. Um, and the idea with a lot of this, you know, and, and most of those things were, the ones that were set up on the tripods were taken with this. But most of the ones that are not, are not. And it's a single lens on a iPhone XR. But um, by putting this on there, you can really get a little bit closer to your subject without, you know, putting the camera right on top of it and you've got a little bit better less distorted perspective so um, these are pretty worthwhile they also make some great close-up lenses and they make uh, uh, I think it's the anamorphic that's the one for video they've got it so they've got a whole slew of stuff um, and then this is the you know if you're going to do this at home um, there's so many good you know off the shelf daylight uh, you know level lights that you can get from uh you know home depot and lowe's and ace hardware uh this one here in the middle i got at ace i think it was 20 bucks for the two of these this one is a little bit brighter this is uh probably a b and h and this one you know is available at um um the the box stores and and ace hardware so if if you're gonna balance if the reason i bring this up is if you're gonna add some light and you're starting with natural light from the window it helps that if you use something that's daylight balanced, or all three of these are daylight balanced. Um, and then if you're going to make a frame, this is the PVC cutter, uh, the glue and the primer, um, fittings and the pipe. It's all available at, uh, at the, at the uh, Home Depot and uh, your local hardware stores. This fitting here is interesting. It's got three outlets, so it allows you get to get 90 degrees, 90 degrees, and 90 degrees. So for a three-dimensional cube, you have these at the corners and that allows you to make, you know, make your cube frame for um, setting up on the table. Here's the, the color wheel that I like. Uh, it's because it's got all of this information on it. Uh, and it's got, you know, little quick synopsis here about theory and definitions of terms. And on the back, it's got all of this and it's got all of these shades and tints on every color. So it's a nice way to sort of say, well, you know, if I've got, this color flower, maybe I want a vase that's this color over here. You know, and the reason I'm saying that is because here's your triangle over here telling you right where, you know, how to get from one thing to another. You know, these guys go together, these guys go, you know, so if it's fun. It's it's a really great tool to have uh, lying around. This is some of the reflectors that I use. Um, these This is a store-bought one. I don't have a picture of the... Uh, uh, the one with the aluminum foil back in short. And this is the diffusers that I was telling you about. So this is just a foam core frame, some butcher, uh, some parchment, baker's parchment on the, on the frame, masking tape to the back. There's another one that's a different size. I had these from uh, mat cutouts. So I just, you know, took these scraps and made, made them into this, you know, made a, I don't know, was that an inch or something all the way around. And then the other trick is that you can use a mirror. So like an inspection mirror, or even just a compact uh, makeup mirror or something to reflect smaller amount of light back into the subject um, to, to establish a highlight. So I, I'll oftentimes use this as well. Uh, and this is, you know, where to get at B and H, this is the, the five and one compact and it's one that's got uh, gold and white, silver and black, and then a diffuser. So that's your five, two, four, five all in one pack, all in one little handy carrying case. Uh, this, this is the one that I use, uh, the, the post-processing, I use Snapseed Retouch Distress X once in a while, and then I really don't use these other three though. I got them because somebody in a class told me they were great. Though Leonardo makes some pretty interesting stuff. And uh, before we had the kind of capabilities we have now with 
with phone software, Vivid HDR was was a good uh, a good one to use. But these three on the top are the main ones that I use. Uh, then the view effects that this is just to show you what you get. So, for instance, if I want to know, you know, how how big the file is, what kind of file it is, whether I actually used any software on it, that's down below, the, on the on the lower screen. This is like this view effects screen is probably two or three pages long. Um, tells you what what the ISO was and what the F number was, what the what the timing was. So it's interesting that that the phone goes down to sixty four. Whether that's you know you know electronic or um, a digital kind of com computational version of ISO sixty four or not, I'm I'm not really familiar with that. But it's a it's a good way because when you start using post processing in phone software, you're going to have original files. You're going to have files that have been processed in so software, and you're going to have files that are exported from that software, which you can't alter anymore. So the idea is that if you keep a file of what you did on an image, and you want to know which one that is, you know, I've got some kind of a system of putting it in, a, in various orders in the files. But if I forget or I'm confused, I can go to view effects, and it'll tell me, well, this is the original file. Right, it's not the one that's that's got the snap seed on it, um, so that's why this is uh, an important uh, software to have in your back. And then this is that um, one that I forget it's Steve, I guess, posted this on your Facebook page a week ago or yeah, a couple weeks ago. Um, yeah, two weeks ago. <clears throat> and I thought this was a very quick, interesting article to read on still life photography, so I put it in here in case people missed it. Uh, this is what I do with my YouTube. I, I've got all of these various YouTube folders, and my still life folders got, you know, I don't know how many is left. You know, well, 123 videos. So uh, this is the slanted lens guy here, which is which is does great work. Um, and uh, this one is a woman who does food photography. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to gain experience and get some inspiration for doing this work. Uh, this is what that looks like if you went to the to Lowe's to buy these things. Uh, that's the pipe. That's the flange. I didn't mention the flange, but what I use, you can make a complete, you know, six-sided cube that's self-standing, but I make it so that there's these floor flanges allows you to screw an adapter into the table, uh, and then you can collapse the table by unscrewing all of that stuff, uh, and it just makes it a little bit more solid. That's the uh, the cutters. And that's that slideshow. So if anything that we want to go back to or revisit, I can do that. Otherwise, um, that's what that's the show. Fabulous. What? Uh, any questions? I don't see any in the chat. Okay. My question is: Should we have Rob come down and do a? workshop like and actually hands-on and do some of the stuff so i think it would be great i, I want to do one of those um yeah and whether we did one down there or i did one through crooked tree it's um you know i haven't really done a slideshow like this before of this extent now that i've got some of this in the can um and i may do another one in petoskey in january mm -hmm. i would be you know, more inclined to, to do a, a workshop. And um, a lot of this is portable. You know what I mean? That's the, uh, that's the beauty of it. You can, you can have a piece of felt and, or, or velvet and um, a couple of things to hang it on. Maybe, you know, there's, there's always a table somewhere, you know, and then all you need is your, your photo gear and a couple of portable lights, you know, and the beauty of all of these LEDs is that, you know, they're all cordless basically. So, um, you can go anywhere you want. Yeah, I, I would be willing to think about something like that. And the other thing is, you know, the other question would be, now, are you keeping a lot of your, like, your pulleys and a lot of these props? Do you hold on to that stuff? Yeah. Would yeah. you be willing to uh, loan some of the gear? Yeah. Okay, because yeah. uh, as I think about it, I've, I'm getting into some stuff. Mm -hmm. and I, when I emptied out my uh, grandfather, grandparents' estate, Mm -hmm. I saved a certain amount of stuff. Right. Maybe we can make up a clearinghouse if people want to do some uh, still life. Yeah. 
maybe we yeah. can uh, take pictures of just some of the items. Yeah. We can uh, share them so that people can do other setups and, and uh, yeah. you know, make it, uh, cause you don't want to have to go buy a lot of this stuff, but we can pass it around and yeah. everybody will do something a little different. I'm sure. Right. Yeah. Be great. Thanks. Yeah. The, the pulleys are, yeah, there's, there's some stuff, what stuff I didn't show, which I haven't really done any serious work with. I've got some fairly nice antique, you know, wooden planes and stuff like that, that is kind of heritage stuff. I would want to, you know, keep a pretty a short reign on, but the other stuff, you know, I think it would be good to, to, to share that stuff. And what I've, you know, I was sort of like a, I'm a reformed kind of garage sale pack rat guy. So I try not to, to bring home much, but you know, the place that we live had a lot of stuff, heritage stuff. And then, you know, I've sort of thinking, well, I want to do some stuff with fishing. So, you know, I've poked around and got some old reels and that sort of stuff. So, yeah, I think it's, um, you know, it's, <laughs> People, people who are already pack rats should be should be forewarned that it's a occupational hazard of doing this kind of work that you could it could reestablish some kind of like addiction. But um, I think it's a pretty good, pretty harmless. And I think that uh, there certainly is a lot of opportunity up here with you know with old barns and uh, and collections and stuff. What really attracted me to the collection that um, the blacksmith instructor Neil Nash has is that he has you know, collected with an intention. He He's trying to develop a blacksmith curriculum at, uh, maybe not blacksmith, but certainly forging curriculum at, at Nukmuk, Northern Mission, you know, Community College. And so he wanted to have setups for, you know, upwards of 10 or 12 students. So he's developed six forges and he's got, you know, probably 10 blacksmith vices and, you know, boxes of stuff in that back room and tongs and all that kind of stuff. A lot of that he's collected from, you know, various guys going out of business or heritage sales or whatever. And then he goes to all of these antiquarian things. So he, I ran into him this year at the Flywheelers uh, down in Boyne Falls. I hadn't been since before COVID and I went down one afternoon to poke around and, you know, ran into him on the way in and he was walking out with a sack full of stuff. So uh, there is there is that kind of collector around if people are interested in, you know, old stuff that that we could, um, you know, photograph. I've already got, you know, him on a tentative arrangement to go up and take pictures of the gear he's already got up there uh, at the college. But we haven't set any dates and I'm thinking it'll probably be, you know, in maybe early spring before it's, you know, too crowded up there and uh, it's too cold. All that stuff is in unheated, unheated spaces right now. But yeah, I mean, I think the communal thing would be a good idea. And then also people wanted to uh, talk about specific stuff. People wanted to do uh, various other setups, you know, you know, glassware, old, old China, uh, any, you know, uh, people who are into dolls, you know, models or whatever. I mean, it's really endless when you start thinking about what what you can do on a tabletop and and looking at stuff closely and making it interesting by lighting it so yeah sure very good well something that we could plan all set all set all right we're um we're done with questions rob can't thank you enough for sharing um so much detailed information and we'll be in touch about a workshop yeah that'd be great thanks so much for having me it's been really all fun right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Rob. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good night. Night.